Hiya, uh, this is the Highway Podcast and I'm your host, Bob, and we welcome uh, back in the studio, can we call it a studio, back in yes, the uh, spare bedroom, <laughs> back my, in your my, my home office. <laughs> yeah, back in your home office, my home office, uh, with uh, Simon. Hiya, Simon, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Very, very good. I, I, good. I was thinking before we got on air, we, we've done the trilogy, so yeah. I don't know what comes next, but whatever comes next is number four, well, that's this. Well, this is number four, the quadrally. I don't Some know the man. quality. I don't, I don't. I don't suppose they even have a name for it. Although Rocky went on for about seven or eight, didn't it? So this could Simon be the four, Simon yeah. Gray Four. Yeah, yeah. Simon Four it doesn't have the same ring as Rambo Four or something like that, no, it does it? Or it Rocky Four. The, the last, the last one, the last one, anyway. The last one. It's the the ultimate, the ultimate episode. But we might get you back at some point in the future. Okay. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, okay Simon. So. Um, just so people are aware who this is, this is Simon Gray. He wrote the amazing book, uh, Suck It Up or Go Home, uh, which I've now read. Uh, and it is well worth a read. Go and buy it. And I hope the sales are going well, are they, Simon? Yeah, they're going, they're going pretty good. What, what, I, what I tried to do with the book, although it's set in a martial arts environment, yeah. what I tried to do with the book is appeal to, the, to a wider audience um, because it's about struggle. It's about adversity and it's about pushing through. So... I wrote it in lockdown, very relevant, I think, for the current environment. Mm. Um, some of my wife's friends have read it who've never been into a martial arts dojo no, in their life no. or a, a Muay Thai school or whatever else. Uh, and they took stuff away from it. That, yeah. that actually, when you think you can't carry on, you probably can. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine who um, used to do martial arts a long time ago, uh, who's very much, uh, he does leadership training and things like that. And he's written books on business development and leadership development. Uh, and he read it and he said, this is brilliant. This is a business book. <laughs> oh, good. Good, good, you know, good. So he, he, he saw it from the point of view of a businessman. Yeah, um, cool. Yes, he'd done martial arts a little bit, but that wasn't his big thing anymore. Uh, he was all about leadership and motivation and building yeah. resilience in leadership teams. Yes. Uh, and he said he rec he's recommending it to everybody that he knows. So I guess I should be getting some sort of commission here. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, we'll have, we'll, 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 we'll have a <laughs> no, negotiation. No, 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 no. <laughs> when the T-shirt comes out, I'll have one of them. All I'll right. send you a T-shirt. I'll send you a T-shirt. <laughs> OK, OK. So um, we're getting to the last chapters of the book now. Yeah. Uh, and I made a few notes. Um, we've discussed it before we went on air about um, and something I want to mention now, which I didn't mention before we went on air, okay. and that was uh, you talked about the training was so hard you were starting to develop like an immunity to pain. Yes. Now, I can, I can, the reason it sort of jumps out at me because I can completely understand what you're talking about there. Yeah. What, yeah. But for the audience who yes. have never put themselves under that level of duress and pressure yeah. before yes. and doing this willingly. <laughs> it was your choice. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, most people would run away as soon as pain raised its head. They're off. They give up. What do you mean? What did you mean by you were sort of? Did you you felt you were developing an immunity to pain? I think um, I talked a little bit a little bit last time about your comfort zone. Yeah, and, you, and your comfort zone is is generally seen as this area around you. I call it the people you know, the places you go, the things you're used to doing. If they're all pretty constant, you're pretty comfortable. If you change any of those then you're probably in a new type of environment. Mm. So I was in a really big new environment, different country, doing something that I had done before, but not to this level. Um, the pain elements, pe what, what's pain for? Pain is designed to tell you to stop doing something. But when you're on a course where pain is an integral part of that, that process, and you can't stop doing something and you push through, you realize that actually you can push through the pain. It's hopefully not going to kill you, which it, it didn't. Um, and you can probably go on a little bit longer, even though pain is telling you to stop. So, you know, you just got got used to it. But people talk a lot, a lot about martial arts. And I've heard this in many of the um, many of the schools that I've trained at in the past. And people say, oh, I'm not training today. I've got a bit of a nagging injury. And I'm like, yeah, but everyone has got an injury. If, if you are a martial artist, you are probably 90 percent of the time carrying some form of injury or other. And providing it's not detrimental too much to your health to train, then you're probably going to carry on and train. So 
I wouldn't say I became immune to pain, but I learned to deal with pain. And that, that was both physical pain and psychological pain, because a lot of the pain on that course was mental. Yeah, that's because what was, I was going to say. You've just yeah. mentioned physical pain, but actually yeah. what comes across in the book is it, it's a, the psychological challenges you were yes. facing every single day. Yes, correct. When you have to get up, get up very early every day, go and do something that you don't feel like doing, then go to work afterwards. Because it, was, um, it wasn't just the course, it was all the ancillary stuff around going to work, mm-hmm. sleep, you know, not sleeping properly, probably not eating properly, being in a foreign country. Um, so when all of those things package themselves together, the most difficult thing for me, I think, was, was the mental challenge because i think we all kid ourselves don't we that, that that we can't carry on we've got an ache or a pain um but actually the mind controls the body oh and absolutely it's yeah. it, if your mind is strong you can you can push through and i guess that's that mindset is what i learned on the course and how many times did that little voice pop in your head going you might just go home simon just go home did you get that or all, all the time yeah. yeah i mean i i knew that i'd never quit i knew that they'd have to you know they'd have to carry me out of the dojo right to quit i knew i wouldn't quit how do you Um, put yourself right because people are going to say that's all right for simon to say that you know i knew i Mm. knew that i couldn't quit most Mm. people that i come across certainly don't have that level of self-belief uh they they they, as soon as they hear the little voice in their head saying give up they're giving up we've seen it haven't we in in times? people come along they think they're going to be champions when they realize they have to put any work in Mm. they're never there i've got a cold i've got a cough me thumbs sore and you never see them again mm. what 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 strategies i mean can you can you can you think how you used the strategy was there yeah. a strategy yes what, what was it you did yeah i mean to use your example someone coming into the the, the muay thai camp and, and wanting to be a champion on you know after a few lessons yeah it's an unrealistic expectation and i think the world we live in now is very different from the world when this course began you know in the 50s yeah. It's a very different world. We're all used to instantaneous, I call it instant gratification. Yeah. You know, you, you want to be good at something immediately. We go on the internet, you can get information immediately. You don't have to work like you used to have to work yeah, to get absolutely. that kind of stuff. So I, I had this belief that in actual fact, although I wanted to get to the end, that the real learning, and this probably happened about halfway through the course, I had this realization. I realized that the real learning was in the struggle. It wasn't in the end goal. It was in the journey. And I think so often nowadays, we want to get to the journey's end that when we get there, if we get there, we look at, we look around and we think, well, I missed, I missed all the scenery along the way. Mm-hmm. Or what happens in most instances, particularly on something like an 11 month boot camp, um, is people, people stop or they, or they decide or they, they tell themselves in advance that they can't do it. And how you talk to yourself is how you will act in life, I think. You know, I do a boot camp now on a on a Sunday morning. Uh-huh. My wife's probably going to watch this, so I'll probably be in trouble. <laughs> but but I, I hear the language that she uses and some of the other people on that boot camp use when, when we're given stuff to do. And, you know, the C word, can't. Yeah. I never use that word. You know, never use that word. Do or don't, but, but can't. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. You know what I mean? Yeah, because so, I, I have banned the word try in the gym. Yeah, Amongst yeah. the instructors, I say, stop telling people to try things, get them to do it or don't yes. do it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. So how you talk to yourself, your beliefs, um, what you believe is the goal of what you're doing. Is it the end goal? You know, getting the black belt for me was nothing. Mm. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't this big special moment that, that – I'd imagined and looked forward to. Yeah, fireworks it was just another going day. off and yeah, it was just, a, and <laughs> just another day in the office. Just another day, yeah. Yeah, it was it was the struggle. It was the struggle. Um, and I, I think I said on one of our earlier chats, you know, that the hardship, I started to crave the hardship because unless you test yourself, unless you push yourself through hardship, you're never going to grow. You're going to stay the same. Mm. So we should welcome hardship. We should welcome challenges because that's how we grow as people. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and nowadays, as you say, in this world of instant gratification, mm. the slightest thing takes us out of our comfort zone. Yeah. You know, students saying panicking and getting distraught about not being mm. able to get on Facebook mm. to put a post of something. And you go, really, is that yeah. your biggest problem in the world? 
Yeah, Do you know there are people good. running across streets being shot at in Syria trying to get water for their family? Yes. That struggle, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and we've got an opportunity, I think, in the West. And you obviously have taken the opportunity several times to put yourself way outside your comfort zone and as a result, grow. Yes. And that's definitely. the that's the lesson, isn't it, in the book? And as you say, it's the yeah. journey. Yes. Enjoy the journey while you're on it, no matter how bad or good it is. Yeah. I, I've got this thing that I don't think you should judge what's going on around you. Just embrace what's going on. Yeah. Embrace it. Yeah. Good embrace and bad. Embrace the moment. Because you um, absolutely. And only only from that do you grow. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty rare. I mean, I, I read Angry White Pajamas many, many years ago when it first came out. And this is a better book. I'm not just saying that. This is a better <laughs> book because it goes in much more detail about your personal struggle. Yes. yes. And I, that's why I think these podcasts talking to you about the, the, the journey is really important. So when people hear this and what you've said, they need to read the book to really have an insight into what's happening. Because yeah. every page is a bit of a page turner in the sense that there's something going on in yes. your personal life, in your training life, in your business. You know, it's like it's it's the whole thing. It's not just yeah. about somebody going to do an Aikido course in Japan. No, there's, if you if you if you read the book with an open mind, whatever your background, whatever walk of life you're in, there are messages about how to live a better life. Not not because I necessarily know the answer to all of that. No, no. But because my experience over that 11 months taught me things that I've tried to share with the audience to say, Hey, if you think about this in a different way, or you try this, or you try that, this is what I learned as a result. And actually you could do the, you could do the same. Mm. Um, and I, 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 I talk, I think, I think at the, the start in the, I always do this word of warning section, which is like, you know, this is what you're getting into if you read the book. Yeah. And I, I say something along the lines of I'm an ordinary guy but I went to do something extraordinary. And if you're reading the book and you think you've got an ordinary life, well, you can change it. Maybe you've got a book to write. You just need to get on the, the journey that you want to get on, how, yeah. however crazy it might seem. If, if you really want to do something, go and do it. And you might have your own book to write at some point in the future. Yeah, I, and I think, I think that's, that, that's very true. And not enough people will take that chance, though. Yeah. This is the thing. I think the stuff you've done, it's pretty rare in individuals. Mm -hmm. um, the more people I meet, the more people are after an easy life. But when you yeah. talk to them about their life, they don't like it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, well, it's the same every day. And I go, well, change it. Oh, it's yeah. easy for you to say that. I'm going, what? Well, but, I don't, you know. But look, but look at the environment we live in now. Mm. You know, w w one of the things that is very evident now from, from, a few of the interviews I've watched with some of the senior international um, sensei in, yeah. in Aikido is that to, to, to run the course as I experienced it back in 2006, 2007 now would probably be impossible right? because the level of hardship, the brutality, the, the arguably the bullying, it wouldn't be tolerated mm. because we have tried to eradicate all of that from society. And on the one hand, that's right to do so. But on the other hand, if we try and protect people too much from the realities of what this world is yeah. and what people will experience, then when they do face hardship, they're not prepared for it. Oh, absolutely. So it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance. And with, with my two boys, I, 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 try, I try not to protect them too much. I want them to experience the world for themselves um, because otherwise every time there's a, a difficult situation, they, they won't be prepared to deal with it. And that, that's so, true. I mean, I'll see it with young people in the gym mm -hmm. um, and I try to give them a different environment mm -hmm. and, and the parents actually thank me for it. You mm -hmm. know, they say you've, you've turned my child into a proper little human being who mm -hmm. can deal with a few things, you know, because mm -hmm. we don't, we push them quite hard, mm -hmm. a pretty old style, old school, really. Um, not nasty, not bullying, but because yeah. it, it, bullying's not what it's about, is it? No. Uh, no. about, and also as an adult, I mean, it's about your perception as well, isn't it? You know? Yes. yes. And I'm sure, you know, and I've read the book, so I know you're going to get bullies in any organisation. It's yes. how you handle them, isn't it? It's yeah, and that's that's part of your learning. I mean, what I'm about to say, you know, people may watch this and they may 
they may disagree with what I'm about to say, but th mm. this is, you remember, we all, we all view the world through certain lenses. Yeah. I was, um, I was out with my family the other, the other week, we, we go and do a activity on a Sunday morning. We go, we go ice skating. We're at the ice arena. Right. And we walk into the place um, to put these, put the skates on it and get ready. And uh, I walked past this, these, these group of girls and my, my wife was with me and I heard them chatting to one another. And this one girl said to another of her, said to one of her friends, she said, um, yeah, I've just been um, diagnosed with anxiety. And I'm like, you're probably about 12, 13 years of age. Now, the reality of that situation is there may be some legitimate reason Absolutely. why she's been diagnosed with that. Yeah. But on the flip side, are we throwing stuff out like that too often now to give people a crutch to hang on to that in some way protects them or tries to protect them from the realities of the world. And if we're doing that, are we actually doing them a disservice? I can really I'm completely thinking. with you on all of that. Obviously my generation. Yeah. I mean, if I turn around to somebody and said, Oh, I feel really anxious when I was 12 mm. or 13, I would say, Oh, sort yourself out. Don't be stupid. Yeah. Pull your socks up, get on with it. Yeah. And I remember reading an article a while back about the stiff upper lip. Yes. And the research proved that during the first, after the First World War, there were less incidences of PTSD. Some of the guys had shell shock, but not as many as they thought they would have, because most of the old boys just got on with it mm. because they came from an environment which was pretty tough anyway, yes. working down the pit, shipyards, shipbuilding, you know, old school working class men. Yes. And they actually said that being in the trenches was in some ways better than being down the pit <laughs> because oh, okay. they got paid. Yeah. yeah, people would shoot at them. They got paid. Uh, they got fed. They got clothed. And yeah, we have to go over the top every now and again and maybe lose a few men. But hey, shit, down the pit, oh, we were treated like slaves, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 weird, isn't it? Um, and you look at you look at you know if you watch the news most nights as I do, which is very depressing. Yeah, don't do. Uh... Yeah. You know, but Boris Boris the, the prime minister, of course. He is. That um, what he is? Oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh, is he in charge? I don't know why I said that. I don't know why. I, <laughs> is everyone he knows who in Boris charge? is. <laughs> no, I didn't know he was in charge. I didn't I know. know he was in charge. I thought Cummings was the prime minister. Well, anyway, never mind. He's, he's disappeared for many a reason. Oh, anyway, yeah, let's not let's bit. not get too political. Let's not get political. No. But he he is Winston Churchill's biographer, yeah. So he wrote he wrote the biography. Now, what's interesting in some of his some of his communications, he he is in part trying to put himself in Churchill's position as the the champion. You know, Churchill got us through World War Two. Yeah, Boris is going to get us through coronavirus, and and you know it's admirable that he he's taking that stance. But what he said, I think it was last night or the night before, he he compared. The, the British people, he compared British people to, to British people in 1942. Now, we're a completely different people in, 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 in our ability to take hardship, in our ability to suck it up, yeah. because the environment that we now live in is very, very different, as you've alluded to, the environment we had in World War I, the environment we had during World War II. Mm. It's a different it's a, it's, it's a different environment and it's uh, probably the same across the world. Now, in a way, that's a good thing. Yeah. In a way, as I tried to allude to earlier, if we don't have an opportunity to face hardship and face challenges, then we miss, I think, what we're probably on this planet for, which is to grow, develop and learn. Yeah. So it's a delicate balance. as with everything. And if you look at nature, it's all about struggle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the natural order of things. Yes. You know. Um, and mankind has got the, the level of consciousness where we can adapt to the mm. environment. We can, as you say, suck it up uh, and get on with things. But even in my lifetime, I remember as a 12, 14, 13, 14, while working in the shipyards when I was 16, 17, the 70s is so far removed from the present day really? in terms of attitudes, in terms of uh, a, a availability of uh, resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, even just things like you would have to find money to go and find a phone box to make a phone call. Yeah. You would, you know, you would, there was, there wasn't this huge choice of, there was either Levi's or Wranglers, I think, 
and and they were really expensive from the US. <laughs> um, books, you had to go and find bookshops to find information, you know, yeah. and everything. Was, and the, the food that we had was limited as well. You didn't mm. have the variety of foodstuffs in the, the shops. And, and that's only looking back 40 years, you know, when I was 40, 45 years, and things have changed so radically. Yes. But I guess when you've been brought up in the modern age, the Northeast, then you just take all these things for granted. Just as I'm sure I took things for granted in the 70s when my dad would say, well, when I was in the 40s and 50s, we never had that, <laughs> you know. Yes, yeah. But yeah. But the level of struggle in your life was quite real, you know. Working yeah. in the shipyards was a pretty dangerous environment. And we, but I never, I never got worried about it. I can't imagine now some of the young lads that I train, being, if I put them in that environment, they'd be way out of their comfort zone. Yes. yes. You know, and I think, I think people do have to, you know, they should. They should at least once in their life face a bit of adversity. Yeah. Stay, out, stay out overnight on the canvas on the hills. You know, yeah, yeah. learn to light a fire, go and yeah. fish. Yeah, you know, just yeah. simple, simple things. For sure, I, totally agree. It gives you an appreciation of you know of of what you've got on this planet, which is Most the opportunity definitely. to uh, grow every day. All right. We sound like self help gurus here, Matt. But- <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I don't know. The, the the world is is changing at a fantastic speed. Yeah. Um. You know, what's the world going to be like in forty years' time? Um. I guess we all have a a slight affiliation to the, the time we were growing up. I was the eighties, you know, you were the seventies yeah. um, and that, and that's natural, but it is very evident that I think the human, the, the human race is less able, despite all the technology, despite all the, the bells and whistles that we have and everything available to us. I think mentally we are less capable than ever to deal with the challenges that we face. Which, which brings probably, me to a point, yeah, right? Go for which it. is a useful segue, Matt. Because obviously, I know you're limited for time and stuff today. Um, but I want to cover this area. You mentioned in your book about mm. uh, PTSD. Yes. And how you, you were going through this struggle. And when it was gone, mm. there was like this gaping hole. Yeah. If I can say that, I guess that's what it was. It was a gap. Yes. Can you go into that in more detail? Because it fits in beautifully with what we're talking yeah. about and the need to struggle. Yeah. So, you know, PTSD, we hear a lot about this these days. I didn't know what it was probably at the time back in, in, in Japan. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I had PTSD, but the symptoms that I had, if you Google PTSD, certainly yeah. some of them, and I wasn't alone in that. So, so we'd gone through this course for 11 months. Every hour, pretty much of the day was, was regulated. There was no chance to think. Um, you became a machine that turned up did what it had to do and then went on and did the next thing. And suddenly when that course ended at the end of February, 2007, I woke up in the morning and I'm like, okay, now what? The people I'd spent 11 months with, I wasn't going to spend that day with, I wasn't going to go and do the same things to the level of intensity that I'd done them. And there was this gaping hole. And for a time, I didn't know how to fill that hole because the meaning of my life for 11 months was that course, mm. getting to the end of that course and, and doing the best I could each and every day. When that was gone, I didn't know, I had, I had no anchor. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know what my true north was. I didn't know where I was headed. Um, and I went through this very turbulent time emotionally where it was probably the lowest point of my life. I just completed one of the toughest martial arts courses in the world. You'd think you'd be really, really happy and and you'd pat yourself on the back and say, Hey, this is fantastic. But I was probably depressed. I was probably at the lowest point of my life. And I didn't know if there was help available, what I should do. And I kind of did what I taught myself to do on the course, which was struggle through and through trial and error, I got myself to the other side and now in a very good place in, in life. But that was one of the downs that wasn't quite expected mm. after you'd, you know, arguably I'd, I'd escaped from, um, I'd escaped from prison, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> arguably I'm, I'm free. I can do what I want. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> but it was the easily probably, well, not, not probably easily the worst time of my life. And how long did that last that period? Probably a couple of years. Really? I, yeah. Okay. A couple of years. I was, my, my, my plan after the, the course, Japan was a stop-off point for Australia. 
Yeah. So the plan was to move to Australia, um, emigrate to Australia, set up my own martial arts school and live happily ever after. <laughs> what I found though was I went to Australia. I enjoyed Australia, but Australia felt very similar to life in the UK, but mm. without my friends and family. So you can imagine as 34 years of age, you, you're in a, a different country. You haven't got the support networks around you. It looks the same. It kind of feels the same. It's the same language. Yeah. But, and I talk about this a bit in the book, the, the re, there wasn't a big enough reason to be in Australia like there was in Japan. Japan was so different. There was a reason to be there. Australia felt similar. The weather was better. That's for sure. Um, and I didn't know whether I was going to stay. I, I kind of bummed around doing odd jobs well below what I'd qualified to do. Uh, you know, I worked in a, I worked in a call center for six months, mm. um, you know, with 18, 19 year olds, I'm 35 years of age. Mm. I was a qualified chartered accountant. You know, I got professional qualification. So I, I wasn't really playing to my strengths, to my abilities in the job market. And I just, I just lacked direction. Mm. And I came back to the UK for my best friend's wedding. I was best man at his wedding. And at that wedding, I made the decision. I chatted to some of my friends and I said, you know what, I'm going to come back to the UK. Mm. And I came back to the UK and I started a business uh, in recruitment. So I went back to my old recruitment company. And then about nine months later, I started a business with two of my colleagues. And it was that point that I got the meaning in my life back. So right. that was the, 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 the pivotal point, started this recruitment business. And then I had a focus. And building a business during the financial crisis was quite similar to doing, yeah, yeah. To doing the course. And interestingly, one of my colleagues who I started the business with, um, is one of the people who reviews the book at the start, Danielle, and she's a very high level uh, karate practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, so we had that martial discipline between us to, to, to keep going. Um, but I remember a conversation with her at the outset because the financial crisis hit. We'd started the business two weeks before the, the crisis hit and left secure jobs. And, um, you know, she was like nervous because she didn't know how she was going to pay her bills. She was going to go and get a bar job and to kind of do the recruitment business half time. And I said, look, we're committed. We've signed up for this. There is no plan B. There is only plan A. And we pushed on and we persevered. And that business is still doing well today. Still, still well, not so well today because of COVID, but yeah. up until January time, it was still going strong, albeit I'm no longer in it. So that discipline um, yeah. replaced the discipline of that 11-month yeah. that course. Yeah, exactly. And then I think, you know, I think in, in, in life, you have to have... You need two things in life, I think. I think you need significance, which often comes from a, a job, um, your, your passion, what you're put on this earth, you believe to do. And I think the other element of that is your relationships. And, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky now. I've got, a, I've got a beautiful wife, two beautiful children, um, and meeting them, and I dedicate the, the book to them as, as well as, you know, my mum, dad, and, and sister, um, meeting them, was kind of meeting them. Obviously, I created two of them, but meeting my meeting my wife was you personally. Was, I think it was a two way thing, maybe. Yeah, yeah, too true. <laughs> that was kind of the icing on the cake, you know, because I got my professional life and then I got uh -huh. my personal life, and things then came back together. And so you found that balance, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I went and did a load of different courses when I came back to the UK. I did I did a load of Tony Robbins stuff. Um, I did a course in London called the Landmark, Fo Landmark Forum, which is a three day intensive kind of you sit in a room with about 50 other people. There's an invigilator and you're there from nine o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. All right. and it's all cha challenging you mentally about why you do stuff, why you've done stuff, putting things right that you think you've done wrong in the past yeah. and just getting getting at peace with yourself and learning to move forward and to see the world as a place of opportunity and possibility. Um, that was a really, really, really good thing to do. Apart from not having a book, what would you have done if you hadn't have had the course? The St. Juicy course? Oh, if I, if where, would, done... where would Simon be now? <laughs> um, have you ever thought about that? Yeah, no, no, I haven't actually. No, I no. I, th I think I would have, I think I would have sought out something similar. Ah, okay, okay. I, I, I have this, um, I have this need to, to, to challenge myself. And I think one of my challenges at the moment is finding what that next challenge looks like. 
You see, that was going to be one of my questions I was going to ask right at the end. So what's next? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, but you've already preempted me, really, in yeah. many ways. But let's let's take it back a little bit, then, if I may. Um, because obviously, uh, you know, we we talk, we've talked about you moving to Australia. That didn't work out. You re realised that actually this is just like the UK, but I don't have any support systems or any friends or anything yeah. around. So you made that decision to set up the recruitment company right in the middle of, of the financial crash. And it worked out yes. um, because you used the same discipline, I guess, that you'd found on the Sen Sushi course. course um, yeah. And I've, I've also I've, I've made a note here that now, of course, you've got new martial arts challenges in the sense that you started Krav Maga, you, you were already involved in uh, Gracie Barra Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, Gracie Barra, yeah. 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 Um, so, what is that? What's continuing your journey now in terms of martial arts, the jiu jitsu and the Krav Maga? Or yeah, where, so Krav Maga. Where we, where do... I, I, I did Krav Maga for about two years, but right. I stopped. I stopped, probably stopped about a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. um, okay. I really enjoyed Krav Maga um, because w when I was when I was kind of winding down from Muay Thai, because my, my thing with Muay Thai is I'd still do all the sparring with 18, 19 year olds, and I'm kind yeah. of mid mid 40s bit slower yeah. i got I, I used to get tagged a bit and and yeah. you, you know the game yeah so yeah. i decided that actually i'd wind down the muay thai and i'd go and do krav maga because i was interested in krav maga because it's a self-defense system and it combined the striking of muay thai it combined some of the wrist locks and techniques from aikido it got some ground game um, so i went and did that for two years and really enjoyed it because i guess of all the martial arts that that I've done, that is the most street oriented completely. Um, you know, you don't do any high kicking. It's all, it's all very, very fast disabling techniques, um, you know, very aggressive style and, and they immerse you in, in the mental side as well as the physical side. So I really enjoyed that. Mm. I, I stopped doing that because I had to pick a lane and I've always believed that You've got to you've got to pick a lane, and ideally, you want to go to the root of a martial art. So when I was doing Krav Maga, I was mixing in some of my, my Muay Thai stuff. I was mixing in a bit of Jiu Jitsu stuff, but because it was Krav Maga and it was a, it was a blend of self, it was a self defense system. It didn't go deep enough on the striking for me, and it yeah. didn't go deep enough on the ground game for me. So I decided I wanted to do Jiu Jitsu, and I'd always dabbled with Jiu Jitsu. You know from the book, Bob, that I did Jiu Jitsu in Japan. Yeah. Um, I decided that if I'm going to pick a path, I'm going to pick Gracie Baja Jiu Jitsu. So I've been training there consistently now for the last two years, albeit it's been less consistent with COVID. The, the school had to shut for a little while. Um, and that to me is my path now, my path to, to, to Black Belt and beyond. Although, oh. although I want to get to Black Belt, it's not the be all and end all. It's, no. it's the journey, as I described earlier. Yeah. I found as well with the Krav Maga, the Muay Thai, that little bit older now with anything to do with striking you take knocks and those knocks are harder to recover from um and if you want to play the game with full intensity which i always do it's my personality then it's very difficult to play it half-hearted yeah. jiu-jitsu is a wonderful martial art because it's it's a lot kinder on the body um it's it gives me it gives me it kind of gives me what Aikido didn't give me. I yeah. kind of went into Aikido because Muay Thai, very brutal. You know, you, you get into a situation, yeah. you're going to punch kick somebody. It's, 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 it's all or nothing. Aikido attracted me because the martial art of harmony, not as I experienced it, by the way. Um, wrist locks, I was controls. Say, harmony? No, that no. That doesn't no. come across. <laughs> <laughs> wrist locks, controls. So you can deal with an, an aggressor yeah. calmly without injuring the aggressor. Krav Maga, very, very, very effective your natural body's response is programmed to respond slightly better to deal with the situation. Aikido, as I experienced it, was, okay, it is a martial art, but the movements are so, are so far away from your natural physical response in a situation hmm. that to be able to use Aikido to defend yourself, it's going to take you 10, 12, 15 years. And do you think, do you think it is achievable within Aikido to be able to protect yourself 
it depends on the practitioner. Right. Yeah. I think there are people in Aikido who have advanced to a very high level who do Aikido for a non martial reason. Yeah. So they do it because it's beautiful to watch. Yeah. They like the yeah. feeling of it. It's, yeah. you know, it, unless you're doing the Sensei course, it can be good for your health. Um, so they do it for a different reason. So you could have a, a shodan, a black belt in Aikido. You could have two very, very different types of people. But for me, the martial way has always been the way. If it, if, it, if it doesn't work in reality, then it's not for it's not for me. Bruce Lee, absorb, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. Yeah. So I think it does work, but it takes you a lot longer to get there. Jiu-Jitsu. You... Go on. Sorry, no, no. Go on. I was going to say, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for me, ticks every single box. Yeah. It doesn't have the striking but I've got that already from Muay Thai, but it has the practicality and the natural body's response combined in a martial art that actually you don't have to hurt your opponent unless you want to, you know, you can put them to sleep. You can mm -hmm. tie them up in knots. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the feeling, if you've ever rolled with um, a high level jujitsu practitioner, the feeling is like being thrown into a swimming pool and drowning slowly. That's what it feels like. And it's, it's a humbling experience. So for me, I found the path to, mm. to, to answer your question in a very, very long, long, no, no, long no. way around. It's just that in the book, obviously, um, you know, you made reference to some of the teachers in, in mm. Aikido on the Sen Shusi mm. course. And I was one, my next question was going to be, um, and I think we might have even talked about it in the previous episode that yeah. you felt that with a good against a good jiu-jitsu practitioner that mm. really struggle to fight them on the ground for example when you were doing the groundwork in aikido yes. oh of course of, yeah. of course i mean some of the teachers on the course they were there to teach me aikido yeah their aikido was much much better yeah, yeah. but walk out onto the street with somebody that knows how to punch and kick somebody who knows how to fight on the ground and somebody who has trained out of the constraints of what is a very systemized way of teaching. Yeah. And suddenly you're in a different ball game altogether. Mm. And uh, I watched a, I watched a video this morning. It was a new, a new can show who's interviewed. I think it was back in 2014. This is the, mm. the head uh, of Yoshin can when I Who was died at, in 2017. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he was the, he was the, I think it was 17, 17, 18. See, it's in the book, uh, as is everything. Um, so <laughs> he, he was he was interviewed and he, he was the guy that came in and the founder of Yoshinkan Aikido, Kancho Gozo Shioda, Inua Kancho came in and he systemized the art. So prior to that, there wasn't a systemized thing you do for this grade, this grade, this grade. He systemized it so they could teach it. But as he said in this video, and as I've heard from other people since in more recent interviews, the problem with the system is you don't have that free play. You don't have that experimentation. So to go back to Bruce Lee, absorb what is, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless and add what is specifically your own. You don't have the luxury of doing that yeah. in, in a systemized way. If you follow that system to the letter. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you are, if you are an Aikidoka, a high level Aikidoka, and you believe that your knowledge of Aikido would help you in the ring with a Muay Thai practitioner, would help you with a high level jujitsu jiu jujitsu practitioner on the ground. I think you're deluding yourself. Mm. And, I, and I know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, from, you've from been there, done it. I mean, I would agree with you. Um, just as being a Thai boxer, thinking that you could grapple with a jujitsu man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's just not going to work, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's about knowing your strengths. Would you say that anybody within the organization is what you would consider a genuinely good fighter, an all-round fighter, or did you not meet yeah. that? Yeah, there was, there was one guy who taught us uh, in Japan yeah. called Murata Sensei. Uh -huh. And he, I know he cross-trained in other stuff. Right, right, okay. He had, he had the most open mind of all of the people that taught us. Right. To go out and find different things to learn. Right. Um, so he's he's somebody that you know you wouldn't want to get into a situation with. No. The other teacher on the course was Romeo Sensei. 
uh-huh. and he he's a Filipino guy, Filipino uh-huh. knife fighting, um, you know, a real, a really skilled martial artist with, with wide knowledge of martial arts. Mm. I think it's, since you say means specialist. Yeah. And one of the things they say to you at the start of the course is don't train in other martial arts. Mm. And I question this in the book, Well, why is that? Do they not want you to find out something else? Do you have to focus on this to really get good at good at it? And the answer probably lies somewhere in between. Mm. But it depends what you do martial arts for. It really does. It comes back to that. But you can't. We I always think we have to be talking about self awareness and mindfulness, which I know we talked a little bit about before we got on the on the uh, on the. the yeah, today. I was going to come to that. Yeah, yeah. You, you you have to you have to be honest with yourself you have to be honest with yourself. And if you've only ever trained in a stand apart, you've got to question your ability on the ground. And if you've only ever trained in a ground style and never stood up and oh. faced punches and kicks, you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, am I capable of dealing with that situation? Finally, if it goes to the ground. So you, you've got to be honest with yourself. And, and yeah. if you find holes in your game or holes in what you want to learn and, You've got to go and find those and, and you've got to evolve and you've got to fill those holes. And there's also that awareness of um, the psychological preconditions that you're, you're training with. Because, yeah. and you know this to be true, there's a lot of guys who train Muay Thai, Muay Thai who mm. never get in the ring and fight because yeah. it terrifies them. Yes. Does that make them any less a, a Thai boxer? I, I, I'm not sure it does. Um, mm. it, it's a different type of Thai boxer, yeah. <laughs> to, to my mind. It's not what Thai boxing was developed for. Um, and, and it's having an honesty. And, and being aware gives you, is about having an honesty and an openness about your own state. Because I know people who train in self-protection, and I spend most of my time teaching them awareness because they'll mm. never have to fight because they'll never be able to fight. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and these are the people who don't, embark on courses like the Sen Shusi course. They don't push the envelope. Um, do you think they should be forced to? <laughs> no, because I think I think Mar- you get so much from martial arts, whatever discipline you practice. Of course you do. Yeah, the, that's, the, that's my point. Yeah, we should never close it off to just people that want to no. fight. No. But if you're talking about Muay Thai, when I started Muay Thai, I never wanted to fight. Mm. I, yeah, I just I didn't want to do it. You said, yeah. But I was honest with myself. And when I went up to Manchester and trained with, with Crew Tony and I trained with some of his fighters, I had to be honest with myself and, and say, I couldn't hang with any of these guys. F- physically, I could kick. Physically, I could punch. But, but mentally, conditioning, mental conditioning, physical conditioning that you get from learning to fight and fighters yeah. classes, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't hang with these guys at all. No. Um, and there's a story in the book that, that I talk about when, when Tony threw me in with um, three Moss Side taxi drivers for a, for a sparring session, which was a, ma- a massive wake up call. Because prior to that, I probably believed, hey, I can handle myself. I can mm-hmm. fight. And, and they schooled me good and proper. Yeah. Um, so I decided that I would fight. I would have that experience. And my first fight, absolutely terrified. Walk into the ring, legs like jelly. I have very little recollection of that first fight because mentally I wasn't prepared yeah. and I had nine fights. I think it was in the end, you know, after about three or four fights, I was probably conscious of what was going on in the ring. Yeah. Prior to that, I wasn't very conscious at all. It was this just, is what I, this is what I said. Reaction. Yeah. This is what I say to the guys. You only really start getting your head into it once you've had four or five fights and you, yeah. you start to relax and you start of now, you know what you're doing. Yeah, but uh, it's true. I mean, a lot of people train in Muay Thai and in other martial arts where sparring is mm. an important part of it. Mm. And it's only until they do the sparring that they realize what they're doing. Yes. I have so many students who I'll say, which is great. Which I love this. Interclubs are great for that because mm. you sort of say, look, there's no pressure on you. Nobody wins. Nobody loses. Just get in the ring. Have a kick about. Yeah. The referee's going to make sure you're safe. Blah, 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 blah. And I see people grow exponentially once they've done that. Yes, they never definitely. wanted to fight, but they'll give it a shot because it's safe. They yeah. do it and they go, whoa, I know what Muay Thai is for now. This is yeah. why you do it. And that's yes. when they get the buzz. And, and they grow mentally as well, obviously. Yes. Well, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? It's that challenge. Yeah. Just climbing in the ring, you probably remember your legs outside the ring being like jelly. Terrible. And then when you're climbing through the ropes, you're thinking, oh, my God, I've committed <laughs> to it. 
I can't get even away now. Worse. Even worse. Oh, no, it's but, even worse. But if you if you if you have fought in the ring and you fought under adrenaline, similarly with Krav Maga, you know where where I used to train in Nottingham, um, they make it as realistic as possible. So you know they turn the lights off and, and yeah. throw you into a state of confusion. Yeah, yeah. You get three people to attack you and they'd be screaming in your face to, to try and recreate that adrenaline rush. And if you are if you are practicing in a dojo environment and you are going through a system and you've never tested that system in reality, um, or you have never tested that system under duress, when you do find yourself in that situation, while the motion may be there. The, the, the mental capability to deal with that situation may not be there. I used to run courses in pubs. Yeah, exa exactly. You could, smell, you could smell the yeah, beer. Yeah. Back in them days, you could smell the cigarette smoke, the atmosphere, yeah. the chairs, the obstacles, you know, and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd turn the lights out in the toilets and somebody would go on the loo and somebody would jump on them. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Looking yeah, back yeah, on yeah. it now, you think, oh, my God, I'd probably get locked up now. But yes. that, was, that was in the 80s, you know, the early 80s and 90s. But it's scenario scenario based training it's really yeah. important for yeah, self protection get, it, get as and, close and, to reality and, and having can. the right mindset you know yeah. which comes back to what you were talking about awareness you know when when you you spent a lot of time doing seiza you spent a lot of time mm. in japan and i think i i did ask you about this probably in episode 1 about uh, did you ever did you get involved in any formal system of meditation or that type of training awareness mindfulness training not in japan no i'd had um my, my, my baptism into meditation happened when I was 16 on a, a, a Kung Fu summer course. I used to do Laogar Kung Fu. Yeah, I remember and that. They, they, they used to, to get you to meditate at the end of every class for half an yeah. hour, and I used to fall asleep. I didn't, yeah. I didn't really know what it was all about. You didn't know what was going on, yeah. No, the, the, the whole mindfulness, self-awareness stuff, it completely bypassed me in, yeah. in Japan. I, I, I missed I miss that, that bus. That I'm sure it was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely missed that bus. When I came away from Japan, that whole dilemma, do I stay in Australia, come back to the UK? And having come back to the UK and been on these Tony Robbins courses, the Landmark Forum, that's when I started to think and to really appreciate the power of the mind. Yeah. And this thing called the law of attraction, we may have spoken about before, yeah. um, that what you think about comes about. And I, I, started doing, um, I started doing currency trading. You know, like stocks and shares, but yeah, you were talking about this the last on the last podcast, I think. Briefly. Yeah, and and I've read a lot of books on that. I've had a, a coach in the states that's that's taught me some stuff on that. And what that game is all about is about self awareness. It's about mindfulness. It's about questioning what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, we're all motivated by you know by two things: hope and fear, and the truth and the reality lies somewhere in between. So I didn't really get into this whole mindfulness space, self-awareness space until after yeah. I'd, I'd finished the course. So if I'd have written the book the day I finished the course, all of that deeper meaning, all of that self-reflection, yeah. all of that kind of mindfulness stuff, meaning of life type stuff, it wouldn't be there. It wouldn't no, be in the I book. I was going to say that, you know, because people do make this mistake of, well, go and do, there's a woman wrote a book called 100, years of, 100 Days of Solitude. And it was about, she spent some time on an island in a log cabin, fending for herself with some supplies uh, and meditated for 100 days, 100 days of solitude. Wow. And she didn't write the book until five years later. She said, yeah. because if she'd written the book when she came out of it, she wouldn't have got anything out. She would have just, it would have been a timetable of what had happened. Yes. She said it wasn't yes. until four or five years later she realized how much her life had changed as a result of having put herself through that private, through those sort of privations. Yes. Uh, and I always say this to people, don't wait, give it time. When you've been yeah. doing something that's intense, give it a couple of years before you start to look back on it and reflect. Yes. But, uh, but people don't put themselves in a position of anything to reflect on, usually just how shit their life has been. And then yeah. they reflect on that and go, I wish I'd done this. How many yeah. people have said that, Simon? Yeah. How many people have said, I wish I'd done the Sen Sushi course? I wish I'd taken up Thai oh, Box. I so wish permanent. I'd started Crab Maga. Don't yeah. wish, just do it now. Yeah. It's Mar it's Marlon, exactly Marlon Brando on the waterfront. I could have been a contender. Yeah, I could have been, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's quite sad that 
we live in the West where we do have all these resources and the potential. I mean, if you lived in Thailand as a working class or a, a poor person, you mm. would just spend each day trying to live just to exist. Of course, just to yeah. create a living, you know, just day to day, hand to mouth existence. We don't, they don't have time to be anxious. They don't have time, you know, none of these, because they're living in the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. And we've got this opportunity to put ourselves, you know, out of the comfort zone. And yet mm. still have, you still had a safety net. You could have at any point gone, I don't need to do this. I'm going home. Yes. You know, and it just, it, it amazes me that people won't take that chance. And I'm hoping that people read your book and be inspired, as I'm sure you're hoping they are, be inspired. Yeah, that's to go, you know what? To. I'm going to do a challenge. Even if it's a small thing, I'm just going to, I'm going to take that challenge and then see what happens. I mean, yes. You hear so many people say, but what if it goes wrong? I go, but what if it goes right? Exactly. That's and if it goes thing, wrong, always, that's, you're going to learn. That's always been my mindset. What yeah. if it goes right? Just imagine what it'll be like. Yes, but people yeah. don't. They, the majority of people tend to, okay, but it might not work out. But what if it does? And even if it doesn't, think and, about and what it, you're going to learn. There is no failure. There's just feedback. That's all exactly. there is. That's always been a maxim of mine. I've never yeah. failed. I've mm. always just had feedback. Some yeah. of it's been good, some of it's been negative. Doesn't exactly. matter. Embrace exactly. it and move on. Because life's too short to, to to beat yourself up about shit that's happened, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So it sort of coming at the end of this now. Um what's your how do you see yourself? Because obviously you've written a book a lot, you know, you you lived through the experience. You've mm. written a book many years, many ten years later, right? And you've You've had all these time. You've had this time to reflect and think and regurgitate. And what what are you going to be doing in? And you've got this challenge, which is, I guess, the uh, jujitsu. Yes. And I'm sure you've got other personal challenges. Yes. Um. You know, you've got to bring two kids up. <laughs> that is a challenge. <laughs> of course, it is. No, but it is. It yeah. is. And you don't see it as that at the time because you're living in it. And I've got two boys. You know. And I look back and I think, my God, I must have done all right there, you know, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've yeah. grown up really nicely. Yeah, you know, they're good lads. Um, what are you going to be doing in 10 years' time? Well, hopefully I'll still be here. Um, it's, been a, it's been a difficult year for me. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I lost my dad in May. Yeah. And we were yeah. very, we were very close. And yeah, you can tell that in the book. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, we were very close. I, and I, I lost my dad and, and I was right. I was writing the book. One of the main motivations to write the book, because people said, oh, you, you, you did the course to write a book. I didn't. No, I didn't. No. If I'd have written, the, if I'd have done the course to write a book, I'd have written it 13 years ago. Yeah, of course. I'd got this story in my head. And when somebody close to you is, is nearing the end of their life and we all go through this. Uh -huh you have a very big sense of your own mortality. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to finish the book so my dad could read it. He, he passed before he could. Um, but the other reason to write the book is I'm a dad now and I want my boys to take some of the lessons that I've learned and to absorb those and have a reference point for, for their lives. Mm. So that was, a, that was a big motivation. So it's been a really strange year with the coronavirus background and all of this kind of stuff. So I'm working on another book now which kind of takes lessons from life, from martial arts, from business, from all the different stuff that I've done and kind of talks to my younger self with the view that my younger self is my two kids. Yeah, and provides yeah. them. I don't have a title for it yet, but th there's one there's one formulating. Okay. So so that's uh, if we go into lockdown again, that's going to be the next the next project. Um, for me, I'm 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 still I'm still searching for that next big big thing one of the things i've been trying to get into is into the charity space i'd like to i'd like to give something back mm -hmm. not in terms of you know i'm going to donate this and put this money in this tin or whatever else but actually in terms of in terms of time in terms of helping an organization because I've, I've been a non-exec director i've run businesses very hard to get into that space particularly at the moment because everybody's right. everybody's struggling yeah. so I'm, I'm i'm actively trying to pursue that I've got this other book in the back of my mind. My martial arts journey is still going on. Yeah. It will go on until the day I die. I will never quit martial arts. Mm. And that form is now Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, which I'm really enjoying. And I enjoy the environment. And as I say at the end of the book, uh, uh, Gracie Baja Nottingham, I found what 
I was missing from Japan. Yeah. I found that discipline, that hard training, and I found a collection of people that feels like a family. It feels very close. It's very tight knit. And I really value that in my life. Mm. Uh, that's what I find in the martial arts. I'll always do martial arts until mm. I drop dead. Yeah. And, um, and I'll hobble around the gym until I, I can hobble no more. Then I'll be in a... And the joke is I will become the Stephen Hawking of Muay Thai. Uh, <laughs> but, but having said that, I'm also learning sword and other, yes, other yeah. new things, you know, because you want to learn new stuff, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I'm hoping that's what motivates my students to carry on. Um, but, you know, I, I agree absolutely with what you're saying i'll always be doing martial arts i know yes. you'll always be it'll always be there it's part of you isn't it yeah or, it's always. a family thing isn't it as well it's that camaraderie that group yes. thing that you get in a really tight knit oh, and i mean it, it's generally speaking an old school style of club mm. it's not your modern sort of mcdojo type thing it's a where a group of guys and women come together train yeah. hard have a laugh and then stay in touch with each other. And I've had yeah. students for 35 years in Birmingham. 35 years, I've still wow. got students. It's nuts, wow. isn't it? It's great. That's, but that's great. what I like about it. That's yeah. what uh, drives me to go to the gym, you know, on wet, cold evenings when my hip's bad and my knees are burning. And I just go, I'm in front of a bunch of kids and I like nothing better. They're all laughing and run up and down. I'm thinking, yep, they're the next generation of Thai boxers. Exactly. In, in, in 10 years' time, my boys will be 17 and 18. You know, I'd like to see them in martial arts, probably competing to a, a decent level. Yeah. Um, Leonardo da Vinci mm. is, is somebody that I read about. I talk about him in the, him in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the greatest inventors of any lifetime one of the greatest human beings that probably it, it, ever lived it, yeah. exactly and and two things that 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 he said i try and hold very close to to where i'm going what i'm doing and the first one is that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication so we all build really complex lives and i think we hit a pivot point in our lives probably about my age where we try and simplify things yeah. so i'm trying to simplify my life make it calmer more relaxed where it's been more complicated in the past and the other thing he talked about was, I'm going to say the Italian wrong, but you'll know the meaning, which is curiosita, which is curiosity. And I think your level of curiosity should grow throughout your life. So while I'm trying to simplify my life, I'm creating more space for curiosity to pursue other interests, to pursue other things, to read more books, to, to educate this, where the body starts to fail a bit, this gets stronger. And that's the, the parody or the um, dichotomy of life. Yeah. You know, your body gets weaker, your mind gets stronger. And when you're younger, your mind's weaker, but your body's stronger. Absolutely. And in the middle, yeah. you, you pass at the halfway point. So that's what I'm kind of thinking. See, my big maxim, and I say this to all my students, life is an attitude of curiosity. Yeah. That's what it should be about. You know, I've yeah. always, I've always, always uh, stuck with that. And I, you're right. As you get older, that becomes more important. That If yes. you haven't had that curiosity when you were younger, and you haven't fueled it by reading and studying and researching, then when you get old, I meet old people. Well, I say old people, people my age, and you look at them and they go, you, you're still reading books. And I go, I buy books every week. Amazon was the worst possible thing that could happen to me. I'm constantly, <laughs> I mean, I haven't just got them for sure. You know, I actually read them. Yeah, I've, got, yeah. I've got rooms full of books and they're constantly coming into my house. You know, Jen, my partner's always gone. You hear the thud on the mat and the dog grabs it. And virtually all of my books have got teeth marks in, you know, <laughs> but, yes. but you, you've got to learn. You've got, and we've got resources now that if you can't get a book, you can read it online. And best universe, obviously best yours university. will be a Kindle. I mean, yours is going to be an audio book soon. Well, it's hardback, paperback, Kindle. It's going to be an audio book before Christmas. And you've, you're just about battling through the audio. Yeah, and, I, and, I've, and I've done it myself, Bob, because... I know. <laughs> the, 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 uh... It's your voice, isn't it? Well, and, and you know, I've, I, the celebrity world. You yeah. Know, you read books by certain celebrities, and you know they've not written the book themselves. Oh, no. So it's kind of a sanitised version of who they really are. Absolutely. And then you listen to the audio book, they do the intro, and then they pass it on to, to somebody who... I hate uh, that. I, I, I don't get it. So... Yeah. Neither do I. Every word of that book, I've written myself. And that could that whole come out. It. The thing is, it'll come out in your voice, yeah. your intonation, the speed and rate at which yeah. you speak. They're your words. It's like what I like about Stephen Fry is 
he does the audio for his books. Yes. Nobody else yes. could do it. No. Nobody else could read a Stephen Fry book. Yeah, yeah. And your, nobody your, else could read words. a Simon Gray book on audio. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with all the Japanese, and we've got some Hebrew in there and all sorts. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going multilingual in the book. Well, and of course, when people actually do, if they listen to the book and then read the book or listen to your podcast, they're going to hear your voice in it because that's yeah. inevitable. Yeah, yeah. So... On the words of Leonardo da Vinci, keep it simple yes. <laughs> and have curiosity. Yes. I and think one that's good. one final one. Oh, there's one final one. Sorry. The, the, the motto for life, which I, I oh, wear yes. here. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, you know this one. Nana Karobi Yaoki, which means fall down seven times, stand up eight. And Japanese on that problem. note, Simon, I want to thank you so much for the past four hours, which we've done <laughs> theoretically. Um <laughs> And when you get your new book, we'll get you back on again. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. It's All been right. a pleasure. Simon, really it's been enjoyed a pleasure, it. pleasure, mate. An Thank absolute you. pleasure. Right, yeah. cool, 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 cool. Cool. right. Fantastic. How do we do? Uh, we did very good, mate. Perfect. We did very, very good. Um, we did time. one hour and three minutes. Mm. Perfect. Perfect. So I shall, as always, uh, tie the loose ends up, put some Perfect. stuff Thank on. You. I'll send you the link straight away so you get the unedited ver Did you want the edited version? No, just, just send me the edited. Yeah, just yeah. send me the edited. Because it's. I, I was saying to my wife earlier, she goes, you keep doing these videos. What are you doing these videos for? I said, "I said, well, it's really interesting to chat because when you chat to somebody like yourself, you, 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 you go to a higher level of consciousness and understanding about your specialist subject. And I said... Look, at, I'll have this to look look back on in like 10, 15 years, and my boys can see. Yeah, yeah. Me talking about. I mean, it's it's. You've given me a great a great platform here. I, I don't care how many people watch the video. No, no, no. I just I just take value from the conversations and our, our opportunity to reconnect. It's really. Well, it's good. funny because when I do the podcast, I'm learning something as well, obviously, and it, uh, it makes me think about things I, I've done, and you reflect because you can't help yourself if you're curious. Yeah. If you're a curious person, you Brilliant. can't help it. So like all of the different people I've had on, um, you know, uh, Gavin Hedges, I mean, he's an old student of mine uh, from New Zealand. And the enormity of the decision he made to come from New Zealand to England and the change of live on the streets for six to eight weeks, homeless. I didn't even know that had happened to. And it shaped the man he's become. He lives in a little village in Balata. How did that happen? And he, <laughs> he said afterwards, he said, it was brilliant to talk to you about it, Bob. And I said, you know, we've never had this conversation before because yeah. I wouldn't talk to you the way I would talk to you if I was interviewing you, would I? We'd just be having a pint after training and we'd have a laugh, you know. Um, but when when you're in this position, I'm able to ask you questions I wouldn't normally ask you because I'm yeah. asking for an audience. But I also want to know as well. I want to know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I said, I can't believe it. He said, yeah, he said, I thought about it. He said... It was a huge thing I did when I was young, wasn't it? It was mad. Yeah. Coming all yeah. the way from New Zealand to England with nothing, sleeping yes. on floors and then on the, on the street. He said, I lived in litter bins, in bins. <laughs> he said, I was eating food at the back of McDonald's until I managed to get myself a job. He said, at one point, I had three jobs and I was still living in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> it, do, it, do, it does help talking about stuff. It really, it really brings home what you've achieved and... What you've learned so it's been oh yeah been yeah really valuable and, really and it, valuable you know I, I, obviously i've enjoyed it as well um Good story. so well look simon um oh, i've got i got one request bob got one yeah, request cool. absolutely can you do me that review on amazon i've got to do that well i haven't finished the book to be fair until this week okay so perfect. i want to review halfway through it but no, no i can do the review matt i will promise you i will one, do it. once you've done it i'm going to message crew tony and say oh, yeah he needs to do it as well i'll say, say hang on done it uh, yeah, exactly. I see. He's gone quiet. You see, he was. He was. All, he was. He's got to the Japanese bit, and he's probably lost a bit of interest. But um, oh, you see, he's missing a trick there because it doesn't matter whether it's Japanese or whether it's Chinese nice, or Filipino thing. or everybody. Each culture's got some really important yeah. stuff, you know. And it's yeah. you know you were using the words of Bruce Lee earlier on, and it's true of everything culture as well. Bits. When I was learning Italian, I think I told you this. I completely changed the way. I th I see things when I'm speaking Italian or reading in Italian. It's an Italian worldview, which is very different to an English worldview, which is a great thing about when you meet people who have who are multilingual, they're the most 
I guess the most um, balanced people you can meet. They're, yeah. they're quite bright. Obviously, yeah. they've learned five, six, seven languages, but they can see other world views. Mm -hmm. So they're not discriminatory. They're, they're yes. very. You don't get any sense of racism from them because they no, can understand no. that mindset. Yeah, if you learn a language, you learn the culture. You have to. You yeah. have to learn the culture. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, for sure. you know, you have to. But uh, hey, anyway. I better shoot. Get I know you've got ready. to go, mate. Good luck with the house. house. And you, I'll, I will write the review this weekend for you. And I'll you. speak. I'll, I'll drop you a quick text or ring you and say it, it is done. Perfect. Anything I can do for you ever, you just need to, I know, to mate, share. I know, I appreciate that. And let's keep, keep in touch. touch. Anyway. Keep in touch. Good man. Let Thank me you. know how the book's gone. All right. Ready, Cap. Thanks, yes, ready, Cap. Bye-bye.